So we're going to talk about the New Apostolic Reformation. The Seven Mountain Prophecy is dominion, Dominionism on Crack. So a uh, little hot button church issue here. Let's take a look at it. So what is the New Apostolic Reformation? What is it? Well, it's not new. Sorry, it's not that new. You can actually trace its roots back to about the mid-19th century. So about the you know, 1850s, 1860s, somewhere around there, we begin to get some of the ideas behind the new apostolic reformation. You know, one of those things that you've got to understand, if you look at the history of Christianity, if you look at how theology is developed in Christianity, nothing just pops out of nowhere. It usually comes from several different sources coalescing together. So you'll get a lot of different influences, and they just sort of begin to coalesce together, and then boom, you have this kind of new idea that comes up. It's not apostolic in, tr in the traditional sense. When we say the word apostolic, we can mean two different things. Now, traditionally, when we said apostolic, we were talking about this goes all the way back to the time of the apostles. We're practicing the faith like the apostles practiced the faith. So, like, if you go to the Orthodox Church, they will tell you, we practice the faith like our fathers practice the faith. We practice the faith that was handed down to us from our fathers and their fathers and their fathers before them. So if you ever want to see how church was done in about the third or fourth century, about the 200s or 300s, go to an Orthodox church. They're still doing it like they did it way, way, way back then. Okay? Is it first century Christianity? No, it's about third century Christianity. But in a but they kind of refer to it as an apostolic church that, oh, well, we're doing it like the apostles did it. The other way you can think of the word apostolic is that it's a church that's run by apostles. Much as we say, like, the Episcopal church is run by the episkopos, which is just a Greek word for bishop. Or you can say the Presbyterian church is run by presbyters, which is the Latin word for bishop. <laughs> right? So... You could say, well, you know, this is a church run by apostles, so it's apostolic in that sense. And that's what they're talking about. So it's not, this is how the first century church did it, although sometimes they could try to claim it is, but it's a church that's run by apostles. So it's not the faith of the apostles that was preached, it's that it's being run by apostles. And it's not a reformation. It's a restoration. Because in reformation, we're trying to keep what is good and remove what is bad. So when we talk about like a reformation, we're reforming something, but what they're trying to do is what was called a restoration. It's an attempt to, quote, restore uh, a first century church. And I put both of those into quotes. Okay. Oftentimes, you know, we talk about, well, let's go back to the way that we did church in the first century. And although we have some hints through, through the book of Acts and some of the early writings of the early Christians, we don't ever really go back to what we did in the first century. If we were going back to what we did in the first century, we would be meeting in somebody's house. If we were going back to the way that they did Christianity in the first century, we would be meeting in somebody's house, and we would have a patron who provided us all the things that we needed. So they would pay for all the food, and they'd provide all the things that we needed. We would have probably an elder who was overseeing that church, or maybe overseeing half a dozen house churches. But we wouldn't have all these things like bishops and, and, you know, we really wouldn't have an apostle in the sense that we're talking about apostles and the new apostolic reformation. It would be a very different experience than what we do nowadays. All right, let's move on. So what is the uh, new apostolic reformation? It's a loose organization of overlapping ministry networks. There's no, like, denomination. Okay, we are the new apostolic reformation denomination. There's no denomination that goes with this. It's really kind of like this loose organization. Different ministry networks headed by different people are sort of like, let's get together and, and you know, we'll declare each other apostles and we'll talk about this and we'll see if we can get this whole thing kind of going. We're all moving in the same direction kind of thing. This, these overlapping networks give authority to people that they label apostles and prophets. That's where all the authority resides. And the apostles are over the prophets. So the ultimate authority within the church are the apostles. And then there are people who also have authority, the prophets, but they're under the authority of the apostle. Okay. The emphasis in the New Apostolic Reformation is on signs and wonders 
and spiritual warfare. So when you begin talking about, you know, when you begin seeing some preacher up there and he's really talking about, oh, we're doing these healings and we've raised the dead and we did this and we did that, all these signs and wonders and they're having dreams and they're having visions and you, they begin talking about spiritual warfare, oh, we got to fight against these territorial spirits, we need to do all these kind of things, they're probably part of the New Apostolic Reformation. The New Apostolic Reformation is very much part of the Pentecostal and charismatic traditions. Now, for those of you who don't know the difference between Pentecostal and charismatic, it pretty much looks like this. Pentecostalism is a new denomination that came out of the early, well, sort of the late 19th century, early 20th century, kind of given birth in the early 1900s. And charismatic, the charismatic movement is more a movement of the late 60s, early 70s. And that's where Pentecostalism sort of moved into the mainstream churches. So we saw Pentecostalism move into the Catholic churches, the Anglican churches, things like that. That's the charismatic movement. People who identify as the New Apostolic Reformation, they oftentimes refer to themselves as the third wave. That we had Pentecostalism as the first wave, the charismatic movement as the second wave, and the New Apostolic Reformation, they're sort of like, we're the third wave. And so you're going to see names like John Wimber up there, who is part of the Vineyard Movement. So he's also part of this movement, the New Apostolic Reformation. All right, messages from prophets are considered equal in authority to Scripture. That Scripture is not sufficient, that it's not closed. So it's not sola scriptura, as Martin Luther would say, but it's like, oh, well, these prophets have a new word from God. We need to listen to this, right? And it holds the same weight as the authority of Scripture. The ultimate goal is a type of dominionism. And that was sort of the dominionism on crack. They believe that they need to take control of seven different spheres of influence within society and culture and to tell us how to live our lives, to take dominion over it. What they're talking about is an apostle-run kingdom produced by capturing the seven mountains. And the seven mountains of society are family, religion, education, media, entertainment, business, and government. So literally over these seven areas would be apostles who make the decisions in all of these particular spheres of influence, which is kind of worrisome to me. But I'll tell you why later. It's, as I said before, primarily a what we call neo-charismatic. They stopped calling themselves third wave. and They're now known as neo-charismatic movement. At least that's what all the theologian, theologians call them. All right. So who are the leaders? This is kind of like the guy, C. Peter Wagner. He's considered the founder and sort of the leading apostle. He did pass away uh, recently, passed away in 2016. But he was sort of the chief theologian. He's the one who really gave it all the sort of theological support. He wrote a lot of the books, a lot of the, the uh, journal papers on, on this particular movement. So he's kind of seen as sort of the founder and, and the chief theologian, chief apostle in this entire movement. Anybody ever read any of C. Peter Wagner's stuff? I have. It's not bad. There's some good stuff in there, right? And there's some crazy stuff. But like with every human being, that's what you're going to find, right? With every theologian, that's what you're going to find. You're going to find some really great stuff and some stuff that you're like, I don't think so. You know, Martin Luther, great theologian, terribly anti-Semitic, and we should probably just take all that stuff and throw it away, right? Same thing with me. Great theologian, but, you know, there's a few things I say that you guys are like, no, I don't think so. Right? Okay. Moving on. All right. Here's some of the other folks who are involved in it. These people are all considered apostles. Lou Engel, Bill Johnson, Mike Bickle, Rick Joyner. People heard of any of these names? Most of them have podcasts. Most of them have, like, YouTube channels and things like that. They usually run large mega churches. They are usually leaders of large ministry networks. So you'll see them quite a bit. Here's a few more. Cindy Jacobs. Okay, Cheon, Todd White, Lance uh, Walnum. So you'll see some of these folks. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, when you begin researching them, everybody's kind of split and divided on them. You get a whole bunch of people who say, these are the greatest, you know, people uh, ever in Christianity. These are the greatest leaders. They're wonderful. They're terrific. Five stars. And then there are people who are like, these are heretics. They're all, you know, they're all leading us all to hell and things like that. So a lot of divided opinions about them. All right, so where did the New Apostolic Reformation come from? As I said, you can trace its roots back to about the mid-19th century. 
In the broadest sense, its roots can be traced to what we call the Irvingites, okay, who are followers of Edward Irving. Edward Irving was an interesting character. Did manage to get himself defrocked at one time because of his teachings. But he believed that we needed to restore, restore the positions of apostles and prophets within the church. He is what is considered the forerunner to the Pentecostal movement. And so he began talking about we need to have apostles, we need to have prophets, we need to have signs, we need to have wonders. And he started what was known as the Catholic Apostolic Church, which is not Catholic in the sense of like Roman Catholic, like, like we talk about it today. Catholic in the sense that it's universal. That's what the word actually means. And apostolic in the sense that it's run by apostles. So he founded the Catholic Apostolic Church, which is our forerunner to Pentecostalism. And interesting enough, he's the forerunner to the Brethren Movement, which would give birth to dispensationalism. So if you're wondering how dispensationalism somehow ended up in Pentecostalism, this is how. It's connected through Irving. He was kind of bringing a lot of these ideas together, and they would coalesce. So Edward Irving, late 1800s. He believed in the restoration of apostles and prophets, signs and wonders, and especially prophecy. So within his churches, you would have a lot of people speaking out prophecy at this time. And in fact, a lot of those prophecies then began to move into the Brethren movement, and that which would then kind of give birth to the dispensationalism. Pentecostalism emerges in the 1900s, so we all know Azusa Street, right? Right here in LA, yay. The big Azusa Street revival that went on. After World War II, though, there's a break in Pentecostalism. Things seem to be going along well, but then, you know, we have a war, we have other things going on, and after World War II, a very crazy time, that sort of whole post-war generation, there's this break in Pentecostalism that occurs, and it's called the Latter Rain Movement. The Latter Rain Movement kind of looked at, at American society, and they said, you know, even Pentecostalism has lost its edge. We used to have a lot more signs. We used to have a lot more wonders. We used to have a lot more holiness. We used to have a lot more uh, 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 of these spiritual gifts going on, but they've all seemed to dry, they all dried up during this time period. And so now we're going to have a revival, and they called this the latter rain, the latter rain, this new revival that's going to come after World War II. From the latter rain movement, is born out, you know, this is born out of Pentecostalism, seeing this decline in spiritual gifts. But what they were also seeing is a rise in the evangelicalism under Billy Graham. This is the time when we begin to see a lot of the tent revivalists moving around. This is the time when we begin to see a lot of sort of the beginning of televangelism. Television hasn't quite, you know, moved all throughout society yet, but the use of radio for evangelism the big tent revivals, the big revivals of Billy Graham, and then eventually they would move on to television and we get a lot of those early television, televangelists coming out. And so we kind of see this evangelism spreading throughout the country and Pentecostalism sort of jumped in on that. In fact, a lot of these revivalists were Pentecostal. Uh, later on, it is inspired by the healing ministries, so we see a lot of these tent ministries moving around. The healing ministries of Oral Roberts, Jack Coe and William Brannan. Are these names that you're all familiar with? Oral Roberts, right? Jack Coe, is that one that you're familiar with? He was a big tent revivalist, did a lot of healing ministry. And William Brannan. Now, William Brannan, <laughs> kind of an interesting character, okay? Not the best educated individual, wasn't really trained in theology, but he kind of got into the revivalism and the healing and things like that. And he had a very interesting style. He would actually sort of punch people sometimes to knock the cancer out of them, kick them. Okay, he was very um, flamboyant in a lot of ways. And he had some very, very strange theology. He came up with some very strange theology that I'm going to talk about in a little bit. Okay, so in North Battleford, Saskatchewan, Canada, there's a revival that happens at Sharon Bible College. The students and the faculty decided, let's get together, we're going to pray, we're going to fast, school's about to start, right, and we'd like to have revival here at our school, wouldn't that be great? So you got the faculty and the students getting together, prayer and fasting, and they begin to experience what they called a restoration of spiritual gifts. 
So there was some speaking in tongues. They were laying on hands on each other. And they were finding that by laying hands on each other, people began manifesting different spiritual gifts. The gifts of prophecy, the gifts of healing, things like that. So we're beginning to see signs and wonders once again. And William Brannan was the inspiration for this particular uh, revival. He had been speaking up there in this area in Canada. They had listened to him speak. And so he had given a sermon um, explaining his theology on the manifested sons of God. He said that apostles, like himself, and he considered himself apostle, were manifesting God in the flesh. In other words, and this is how Kenneth Copeland would tell it to you today, they were little gods. That literally, that they were so full of the Holy Spirit that they were manifesting God in the flesh like Jesus did. They were like little gods on earth today manifesting God for the, all the rest of you. So these apostles, right, are the manifested sons of gods, of God. Does that, does that sound a little dangerous to you? Does that sound a little crazy to you? Because it sounds a little crazy to me. There was a guy in the 1970s who picked up on this, who believed in this theology. Let me show you who it was. There he is. He used the manifested sons of God theology from William Brannan to declare himself Jesus. And we know what happened with him down in Guyana as he led his followers to drink cyanide lace Kool-Aid. Those who didn't want to drink it, he forced them to drink it. And the mass suicide that happened down there. So this is kind of like, you know, I'm like going, this sounds like some dangerous theology to me. We need to really look at this and think about this. I mean, I have an ego, but I have never claimed to be God. You ask my students, they go, yeah, he's got an ego. Okay. But I have never, ever, ever claimed to be God. Okay. If I do, that's time to fire me. All right. We are one in Christ. We are one in God, we are one in unity. We are one in truth, we are one in faith, we are one eternity.